Nope, we don't need to speed up the process. We don't need to nuke this. You know why? Because this is the non-microwave truth. I am CL Whiteside, and this is brought to you by Time of Grace Ministry. I wanted to make sure I took some time out today to remind you, you're continuing your walk with God and you want to strengthen your faith and, and make sure that you're on the right path. Don't forget about timeofgrace.org. There are a ton of resources on there. We got Pastor Mike sermons. We have daily blogs, daily devotions, daily talks on there. We got other podcasts that you can find. You could even scroll on there and look at a specific topic that interests you or you've been wondering about. And it's going to give you the truth, the biblical truth, the non-microwave truth. Yeah. So go check that out. Timeofgrace.org. Tons of resources. Let's get into our first world problem question today. So in preparing for this episode, we're going to talk a lot about tricky questions, tricky questions. And in getting ready for this episode, I found one of the most trickiest questions or what I found is maybe to be the only riddle. And our first world problem question is, what do you think is the trickiest question that is asked in the Bible? Make sure you leave it in the comments. Hit me up Instagram, Twitter, message me. Let me know what you think. What is the trickiest question asked in the Bible? And I thought about my man, Samson, who's like a, a superhero with super strength. And in Judges chapter 14, he asked a riddle. He asked a very tricky question. And he didn't ask this tricky question to bring glory to God. He asked this tricky question to, to gain some new gear and to gain some more earthly pleasures. Go read about that in Judges chapter 14. But this is what Samson asked. This was his, this was his tricky question. He said this. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. And if you don't know about the story of Samson, you would be like, how in the world would anybody know that riddle? How in the world would anybody know that riddle? And I'll give you a little background. Samson saw this honey that he was like, oh, I want to marry her parents. Go make it happen. Samson went down to go talk to the young lady. In the process of going to talk to her, he got attacked by a lion. Yes, a lion. He ripped the lion apart and he left the lion there for dead. He goes back some time later to go marry the woman and talk to her again. And the lion's carcass is laying there with uh, bees inside of it and honey and honey. And he takes his hand, he scoops the honey out and he eats it. That's nasty. That's a little ratchet. But that's what Samson did. And this is how he came up with this riddle. So when he went to go marry the woman, they gave him 30 companions or 30 people to surround himself with. And he's like, hey, I bet y'all can't guess this. And if you can, let's put something on the line. You got seven days to figure this out. So this was the riddle he asked again. He says, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Like, how is anybody supposed to get that? And have you guessed the answer? If you like, man, I haven't read Judges 14 before, or I don't remember it, you're not going to get this riddle. Maybe you will since I gave you a little background. So this is the answer to the riddle. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? That's a trick question right there. That's a trick question right there. Because if you didn't know that Samson had ripped apart a lion and then went inside the lion's carcass and ate some honey, how in the world would you get that riddle? So we got a few parts to this first world problem question. First of all, what do you think is a tricky question that has been asked in the Bible? You don't have to pick the same one as me. Second, do you think Samson was being fair? Like, do you think Samson was being fair? And what do you think the purpose of most trick questions are? And the third thing is this. Would you eat some honey out of a lion's carcass? I know you wouldn't because that's nasty. I think that's just disgusting. But I would love to hear from you. Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube. Drop the comments. Handle is Champion Life 23. And this is our first world problem. It is dinner time. The title of our episode today is That's a Trick Question. Ooh, in, in our in our culture, in our society, there are so many trick questions that people will ask you from time to time. And they're usually doing that to try to manipulate a situation, trying to get you to fall into a trap, trying to get you to answer stupidly or be like, aha, see, see how they answer. I told you. And we got to realize the same thing happens in a, in a spiritual sense. The enemy, the devil, our sinful flesh as well uses trick questions to get in our head and it's like why it's because they're hostile towards god and the whole purpose of the enemy using trick questions is because the enemy wants us to be disappointed in god it wants us to be angry at god it wants us to think that we should be god we could outsmart god like seriously because if you think about it if i'm disappointed or, or angry in god 
I'm not going to worship him. I'm not going to praise him. In fact, I'm going to be looking at him crazy and saying he should have did this. And if I think I can outsmart God, why in the world would I worship a guy or praise a guy that I think that I'm on the same level as? Um, so something to add to this on why the enemy wants us to use trick questions. The enemy ultimately wants us to think that we should be God and that we're on the same playing field as God. And so many trick questions that pop up in our head, especially as Christians and why we do some of the things we do is because we like, man, am I missing out on something? Man, I got to be missing out on something. Is God holding out his absolute best for me? Because right now that looks pretty good. That looks pretty fun. So I think I should do that. And the whole purpose of trick questions is to damage our relationship in God, get us doubting God, getting us to say, you know what? I should be God. I don't need God. That's the whole point of trick questions. Now, we're going to look at some trick questions in the Bible. We're going to look at some trick questions in the Bible. And this is a definite trick question that was asked from the beginning of time. We're going to go back to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Now, think about this question. If I just asked you this question, how would you answer it? The question is this. You should strive to be more like God. Should you strive to be more like God? Most of us are going to be like, yeah, we definitely should strive to be more like God. Isn't that what God's word says? But look at Genesis chapter three. We're going to look at Genesis chapter three, how the enemy manipulated this question and why it was a trick question and how he was trying to trap Adam and Eve. And he actually was successful in doing it. Genesis chapter three, verse one. He said to Eve, that's Satan. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You see how he, he manipulates the word right there. Any tree? You can't eat from no trees? Like, wow. No, he, God just talked about one tree. But look at what he asked to this question, and he starts to set the trap. I mean, he's already setting the trap, but look at, look at how he advances the trap. He tells Eve, he says, you will not die. And he probably was thinking like, well, you're not going to die right away. I mean, you will eventually die, but you're not going to die right away. And he goes on to say, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he posed this question to Adam and Eve. And he's like, don't you want to be more like God? I'm telling you, God is holding out on you. And that was the trick question right there. You can strive to be more like God. Don't you want to do it? Don't you want to do it? And what we see with this is we do want to be more like God. But what did Satan leave out? He left out the fact that this is a definite worthy goal, but you should never step out of God's will. You should never be uh, disobedient in order to get what you think that you want or you deserve in that way. And that's where we always just got to look at ourselves and say, man, what am I doing? Make sure we are checking our steps. We got to check our steps because that was a trick question right there. Should you strive to be more like God? Absolutely. You should strive to be more like God, but not when it comes to stepping out of God's will and taking matters into your own hands and being disobedient. Uh, second question we're going to look at that's oftentimes posed in the Bible and posed to Christians. And that question is, is this out of God's timing? Is this out of God's timing? Like that's a legit question, isn't it? That's a legit, legit question, right? So when you think about, all right, finding a good man or finding a good woman, when you think about getting blessed and how do I know to make this business move or this career move? Like, how do I know to do that? Is this out of God's time? And that's something that we oftentimes think about. Is this that time to make that move? That's what it, a lot of times we're, we're thinking about. Is this that time to make that move? Is this part of God's timing? Is God telling me to take a step? Is God telling me to do this or God telling me to wait? Is God telling me to be still or is he telling me to move? We're going to look at Genesis chapter 16, 17 and 18. And Sarah and Abraham, they were wondering this exact same question. Is this out of God's time when it came to them having a baby? Was it out of God's time when it came to them having a baby? And in Genesis chapter 16, it tells us about Sarai getting this great, this bright idea. This bright idea, and it says, the Lord has kept me from having children. You know what, Abraham, or Abram at the time, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So if you're not familiar, you don't remember what happened. Abraham went and hit the servant, had sex with the servant. She conceived, she became pregnant. Then drama came. <laughs> there was plenty of drama that came. 
The slave start, servant, she started to started to despise Sarah. I. You know a woman's going to feel when somebody's despising them. So Sarah is like, Abram, that, that slave servant has started to despise me. Like, you need to do something about this. And Abraham is like, you know, Abram at the time is like, do what you got to do. I, I really don't care what you do. So Sarah, I, she starts treating the slave servant that she told her husband to have sex with and then got mad because she was pregnant. She started to treat her bad, treated her so bad that the slave servant ran away. And the angel of the Lord had to go get her and say, hey, Go ahead and go back. Go ahead and go back. But look at all this, this drama. And the question that they were posed with, the trick question they were posed with is, is this out of God's time? Because we got to realize something about Sarah I and Abram at the time. They were in the 80s and the 90s. So they were old, old. And even back then, that was way past the years of bearing a, a child. So they looking like, should we be helping God out in this way? Like, because Sarah I is too old. She's old, old. She's old, old. And what we see with this as well, on this episode of that's a trick question is how their doubt caused them to to laugh at the promises and the covenants that that God had established and given them in Genesis 17 verse 17 it says this Abraham fell face down he laughed and said to himself will a son be born to a man a hundred years old will Sarah bear, bear a child at the age of 90 so he he laughed at this thought after God had reminded him of the promise like hey I told you I'm going to give you a child through Sarah. I didn't say I was just going to give you a child by any woman. You didn't have to take matters into your own hand. So he reminded him of this. And then we look at how Sarah responded to this in Genesis chapter 18, verse 10 through 12. Then one of them said, this is when the three visitors came to visit Abraham. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife will have a son. She like 90 something. She old. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out, and my Lord is old. Will I now have this pleasure? She's talking about the pleasure uh, of having a, a child. And what we learn from this is that doubt or wondering is this out of God's time. And that doesn't give us the OK to manipulate situations or to be disobedient. We don't need to step out of God's will. And sometimes in our in our day and age today, we like, well, how do I know if I'm stepping out of God's will? Look in the good book. We got we got to look turn to God's word because he definitely tells us what he does or doesn't want us to do. And what we can also learn from, from Sarah and Abraham is to remain faithful, just to remain faithful. When we step out of God's will, there, there are consequences and they cause themselves some headaches. They have baby mama drama. God wants to give us the best. And that's something that we can rely on. That's something that we can, we can take to the bank because we know that God is good for it. God is absolutely good for it. Now, we all have to just realize that there are trick questions that come into our own heads because of our, our sinful nature and our sinful flesh. And on this episode of that's a trick question, we got to look at some of the trick questions that pop up in our head because of our sinful nature, because of the experiences that we have, because there is sin in this world, because our minds have traps. And that might be surprising to some of you, but we got to think about some of the traps that our own minds sometimes po pose to us. And some of the questions we might be asking ourselves, like, is this really that bad for me to do this a different way than God has commanded? Like, that's a question a lot of times that we pose in our mind. Like, can I do this a different way? Like, I know in the Bible it says, this, but I want to do it this way. I think I can get away. That person seemed to do it and they seem to be fine. They seem to be OK. They seem to be getting blessed. A lot of times what appears to be getting blessed is, is earthly winning. But earthly winning doesn't always equate to a blessing because earthly winning can be some sin. And sometimes that we don't know how that looks, but we got to use God's word to, to look at that and to truly examine that. Another question that we think about or we ask ourselves is like, can I responsibly sin? Can I responsibly sin? And what I mean by that is I'm going to get filthy drunk and then I'm just going to catch an Uber or, or catch a Lyft. All right. I know I probably shouldn't be having sex, but all right, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to be protective when I'm having sex. I'm going to make sure I use a condom. I'm going to make sure that she's on birth control. I'm going to do take these different avenues to try to make our sinning more responsible. Like those are trick questions that we pose to ourselves and our heads. A lot of times that are that are traps. Uh, another question that gets posed in our minds sometimes is we, we look at other people and like that person's doing this, that person's doing that. That's really, really bad. And we start to think to myself, think to ourselves, am I better than so-and-so? Because I don't have the same vices as them. My sins are a lot more quiet. And we start to think to ourselves, like, do I really even need a savior? 
like I'm a pretty good person, but we definitely need a savior. It is not because of the things that we have done It's because of God's grace. God has gifted us with this. Can never forget that. Never forget that. Another question that pops up in our head is definitely a trap is like, you know what? If I stand for God, what am I going to lose? What am I going to lose? Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose this relationship? And so many times we think about all the different things that we can lose instead of think about the things that we can gain. We can gain peace. We can gain understanding. We can gain God's absolute best. We can make sure that we're walking on a path with him and not with the enemy or with our sinful flesh. So that's just something to keep in mind. And when we think about this, there are times that traps come up in our mind and we, we just wonder to ourselves because we think about all the stupid things that we have done. We think about all the sins we have done and we say like, man, what I did was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. What I did was so bad. Am I really forgiven? Does God really love me? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. But that's a, a trap that sometimes plays in our mind and we forget about the fact that God's grace extends to all of us, God's love extends to all of us. God died for every single one of us. He died for every single one of us. And we aren't children of God because we earned it or we were so awesome is because he found us. He found favor in us. He, he blessed us with, with the gift of faith. So you are forgiven. It's done. Jesus died for you. Best believe you can take that to the bank. Now, how do we answer these tricky questions. How do we answer these tricky questions that, that pop up in our mind? We're going to look at the best person who answered these tricky questions, which is Jesus. Jesus was a beast at answering these tricky questions. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 15 to 22. And this is the imperial tax when, when Jesus is posed with a question that is meant to trap him and to mess him up. We're going to start at verse 15. It says, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? So pretty much what they're asking is, should we pay our taxes? Now, the first thing we got to look at is just how do trick questions work a lot of times? Trick questions are there a lot of times to try to make us feel good or feel better about ourselves. Did you see how they tried to butter Jesus up? They said, we know that you are men of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Like they tried to butter Jesus up before they posed that, that trick question. A lot of times trick questions are there to make us feel good in the moment or to make our flesh feel better. And that's the whole point of trick questions. And a lot of times with trick questions, there's usually some sort of truth with it. Like, was Jesus really a man of integrity? Absolutely. Was he a man of truth? Absolutely. And a lot of trick questions that we pose in our minds or allow or, or come to uh, come to the surface, there is a little bit of truth in a lot of them. Not all of them, but in a lot of cases, there is some truth. And the big thing about trick questions, though, they want us to look outside of God's will. They want us to look outside of God's will. Now, how do we know that this was a trick question? How do we know that this is a trick question? Well, the first thing is this. Both his enemies were teaming up and, and talking together. So if you got two enemies, you know, two people that don't mess with you, two groups that don't mess with you coming like, hey, I got a question for you. And they giving you all these compliments. That's a sign that is a trick question. So you had the Pharisees and you had the Herodians. And what we got to see is these are two enemy groups of Jesus. The Pharisees, they were looking for Jesus to say, you know what? Pay the tax to Caesar. Pay that tax to Caesar. And what they would have done then is they would have said, look. Jesus is not a man of God because they hated this tax. They were like, man, we are unfairly taxed. They would have made Jesus seem like he was a sellout. They would have made Jesus seem like, you know what? See, we giving our money to this pagan uh, political leader and he's using this money to go spend it in the temples of not worshiping the real God. I told you Jesus wasn't really for God. I told you he wasn't really for God. So they were looking to make Jesus seem like he was a sellout. And then that would have turned the people off to him in a lot of cases. Now, if he would have said something like, don't pay the tax, the Herodians would have been like, hold up, wait a minute, because the Herodians were the political leaders. They would have been like, he trying to lead a rebellion. 
This man just said to clearly break a law that Caesar has established. We got to we got to throw him in prison. So they were kind of looking for him. They were like, one of us is going to win. One of us, bottom line, is we're going to be able to get rid of Jesus. But Jesus is a lot smarter than that. So let's see what Jesus did with this trick question. Verse 18. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. The first thing we got to do is we got to call it out. When we see a trick question, we have to call it out. There are so many times when we act like, well, that's a really good question. And we, we want to flirt with temptation. Jesus calls it out. He calls it out for what it is. It is a trick question. And then what we got to see with this is Jesus doesn't just look at this from the angle that was presented. He looks at this from a different angle. That's why he said, bring me the coin. And what that teaches us is to look at things from a godly perspective. When we get trick questions, a lot of times people will say it's an either it's either A or it's B. But a lot of times there's a C and there's a D. There are other options. And there are definitely a biblical perspective and a godly perspective that we can put on these trick questions. And we just got to remember that just because the enemy only gives you a couple options. You got to remember God gives us more options in this way. And what we see what Jesus did, which was awesome, too, is he questions the question with a question. And in our world, in our society today, we can do that. We can do that because we have God's word. We can always take a question and look and say, what, what does it say in scripture? How does God feel about this when we get posed with those trick questions or we get posed with with any questions? And that's just the benefit, the awesome benefit that we have today to use God's word. Now, let's look at how Jesus answered on this episode of that's a trick question. Then Jesus said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. Whoo. That's a good answer. That's a real good answer. And what Jesus shows us with this answer is that we have dual citizenship. So God lets us know, Jesus lets us know in this moment, like, yes, we are a part of this earth. We need to follow the rules on earth. Pay the tax. I I put that in my commandments that if I put an authority over there, you need to honor the authority. You need to do what you need to do. As long as they're not going against my word, then you, you need to honor it. So he reminds us like, yes, you should pay taxes. But then he also reminds us that We are a a kingdom membership, too. We are a heavenly membership as well. And with this, he reminds us, like, we need to make sure that we're committing to God as well. We definitely need to commit to God as well. And what he's really reminding us is that we have the stamp of God's approval on our souls. And that's a gift. That is a gift that we have. And because of this gift, that's why we want to be committed to God. That's why we want to love God. That's why we want to serve God. That's why we want to do the good works that he has presented to us to do. Because of the fact that God has gifted us with his stamp of approval on our souls. So the question I have for you is this. Have you been living too much for this world? Have you been living too much for this world where your only focus is on this world? I got to do this. I got to do that. And you're forgetting about your citizenship to to heaven, your citizenship to God. And then vice versa, I got to ask you, have you been ignoring opportunities to do good works on this earth because you're like, I'm just getting ready for heaven. And God is like, well, you on earth right now. And part of loving me and serving me is to make the most of the opportunities that I'm presenting you with. Because some people will hide behind excuses. I'm just getting ready for the Lord. So that don't mean you can love people on the earth. That doesn't mean you can serve God on the earth still. So that's just a question for you to think about. And let's look at what and how Jesus... uh, uh, what, the, what they thought about his answer, even the people that were his enemies. What did they think about his anima, answer? Verse 22, when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. So what do we have to be amazed about? The first thing we have to be amazed about is the fact that God loves us. Jesus loves us. He proved how much he loved us because he died for each and every one of us. He died, was crucified, suffered hell. And it's not because we're so awesome or we earned it. It's because he is love. He did that for you. He did that for me. And it's not like we earned it. That's that's awesome. That That's a trick question that always pops up in our mind. The second thing we can think about is God makes us complete. There are so many different things on this world that want our attention, that tell us, hey, you can fill the void through this. Jesus is the only one that can fill the void. He's the only one that makes us complete. He's the only one who makes us not guilty. He's the only one that makes us righteous and, and justified. And that's why we can live Christian lives, because He makes us complete. The third thing is, is we have true hope and security through Christ. A lot of times we're wondering like, man, is this enough? 
am I enough? You are enough. But it's not because of anything that we have done. It's because of all the achievements and all the blessings and all the grace that God has showered each and every one of us with. Believe that. That's the truth. Believe it, believe it, believe it, believe it, believe it. Another thing, Christ is the only way. So many times we have these these trick questions in our head where it's like, all right, can I do it this way or can I do it that way? Can I get salvation through this? Am I good enough? The answer to that is no. Apart from Christ, you are not. Christ is the only way. He is the absolute only way. So don't let something get in your mind and try to trick you to say, well, you can do it this way or you're not that bad or you're this good. No, no, no. Apart from Christ, we're nothing. With Christ, we have everything we need. Best believe that. And the last thing is this. We can answer those trick questions. We can answer those trick questions because we have the stamp of God approved on our soul and God equips us with his spirit. And when he equips us with his spirit, we can tap into Jesus and be like, hey, Jesus, how you, you know how you answer those trick questions? Show me the way on how to answer these questions. Give me the discernment that I need. Give me the hope. Give me the love. Give me the answers that I need. And this is the non-microwave truth. Thanks for joining me on this episode of That's a Trick Question. Peace punch, Captain Crunch. Say no to drugs and yes to Jesus. I am out.